Dr. Robert Pace is a neurologist specializing in MS at the Memorial Healthcare Institute for Neuroscience in Owasso, Michigan, an hour and 20 minutes away from here. I drove yesterday. <laughs> yes. Dr. Pace completed his medical degree at The Ohio State University College of Medicine and Public Health in 2008 and received further training in neurology through a fellowship in multiple sclerosis and neuroimmunology at the University of Michigan. Dr. Pace is an active member of the American Medical Association and American Academy of Neurology and is a diplomatist, diplomatist, Matt, 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 okay. Diplomate of the American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology. He also serves as associate editor for Medlink Neurology, the leading information resource for clinical neurology, and is a guest author for Aware Now magazine. Dr. Pace is passionate about demyelinating disorders of the central nervous system and is committed to providing his patients with compassionate, personalized care and to advancing our understanding of MS through research and innovation. Dr. Pace collaborates with the Memorial Healthcare Institute for Neuroscience MS team in clinical trials. He and his partner, Dr. Cody, as in, is it Ginny? Ginny, okay, Cody, yeah. Launched Gray Matters, a podcast focusing on MS geared to patients, caregivers, and healthcare providers. Gray Matters focuses on the latest advancements, research, and personal stories related to MS and can be found at memorialhealthcare.org slash podcast. Dr. Pace's topic today is information for the newly diagnosed. Welcome, Dr. Pace. Sorry, that's, that's uh, intro is what happens when you fail to respond to multiple emails asking to write an intro. And then someone from the hospital does it for you. Um, I also didn't respond to the email or apparently didn't see the email that I was going to be doing yoga in front of 200 people while wearing a suit. So lesson learned. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Rob Pace. I'm an MS neurologist, Memorial Institute for Neurosciences in Owasso. Anybody doesn't know where it is, it's right about there. Um, and I'm going to tell you guys a secret, but I don't want it out of this room. So. 200 people and whoever's listening on the internet only. I really like being the person that diagnoses somebody with MS. And I, I, I don't mean that in the sense that I like it when people have MS or that I like to see people under stress or anything like that. I like being the person or being there with someone when they first hear about MS because I know what the alternative is. and. Oh, I need, forgot about this. I know what the alternative is. Um, the alternative is, well, the alternative used to be Google um, back in the old days, but as my son informed me, nobody Googles anymore. So now the alternative is chat GPT. More button. How do I? Oh, okay. So now AI will answer these questions for us. So this, by the way, is not the official interface for ChatGPT. I don't know if anybody could tell that it was my shoddy PowerPoint work. Um, yes, yes. So what is multiple sclerosis? And this is what, what most people are left having to do when they're making this diagnosis. Go ahead and hit the space bar again. And you get something like this, just to keep hitting it. Um, so I'm not going to make anybody strain their eyes to see this. Please don't. That's not the intent. Multiple sclerosis, chronic neurological, et cetera, et cetera. Myelin, demyelination, et cetera, et cetera. Lots of different types, et cetera, et cetera. And this is actually, so I have read the thing. It's actually a very good answer. It's a, an accurate answer and it's, it's true, but an answer being true doesn't make it the right answer for a question that somebody's asking about themselves. And this, without any sort of context, is horrifying. Good. Um, if I do this all the time where I'm uh, Google searching something and I say, well, that leads to another question, that leads to another question. And then eventually this happens. 
And now I'm not sleeping for the next two days. And this is something that happens to patients with something like MS, particularly because MS can be such a horrifying condition. It's something where it can cause any symptom you can possibly imagine. And if you ask, what does MS cause? You're going to see everything in the world. Um, but that doesn't, that, that doesn't answer the question for me. And that isn't accurate for most people. Um, so this is actually my last slide. Um, you can just go through it, fortunately, because I don't want to do this over and over again, because I don't want to give you information. I don't want to make you look at a chart or look at a uh, definition or anything like that. I just want to invite you into the weird ways that my head conceptualizes MS and the way that I usually talk to people about it. Um, you can think of a body in a lot of different ways. So you could think of a body as just a person. You could think of it as a collection of organs, like a skeleton holding you up and uh, muscles moving stuff around and skin holding organs in. And I don't know. I don't know what the other organs do. If it's not a brain, I, I kind of check out, but the, your guts, whatever. Um, you can think about a collection of meridians. You can think about uh, a lot of different things, but the way I tend to think about is the, a collection of trillions of different cells. And there are these trillions of cells living together and they have different jobs. Like some are in charge of moving blood around from one place to another, moving oxygen from one spot to another. Some are getting rid of waste. Some are providing structure to our skeleton so that we can stand on one foot in front of everyone. Um, and uh, in this sense, the brain, the nerve cells in the brain and spine, which is what MS affects, are the, the, the cells that are in charge of making all of the decisions for your body. And that's a pretty big job. That is a lot of stuff. So imagine for all, all of it, all of us have this sort of building, this sort of office tower in the middle that is filled with a billion different offices. And each office has someone doing a job. Like one job might be somebody having to squeeze your right hand. And one office might be in charge of someone sensing cold on your left thumb. And one might be in charge of recognizing the color blue, you know, et cetera, et cetera. MS is like saying that that building is prone to fires. Fire happens and causes damage. Depending on where it happens, you might get a symptom, but you might not. And you actually usually don't. And that's kind of an important point. You usually don't because your brain is amazing at what it does. It is great at figuring this stuff out. And if a fire happens in an area, if your brain can, it'll take that job and move it somewhere else. And it does it so well that 90% of the time, you would never have a symptom. You would never know that that happened. You would go about your life. All the jobs are being done. But not all of the offices are created equal. And if you happen to have a fire in certain areas, your brain might not be able to easily take that job and move it somewhere else. And that means you now have a symptom or are at risk for a symptom in the future. And I'll kind of talk about that part later. Um, and it might be that over the next week or two weeks or year or six months or whatever, you're able to farm that job out to other areas and that symptom can improve. It might be that it never improves. It might be that it improves halfway, but sometimes gets worse. It, all kinds of different variations. But from that point forward, now that's part of your society of living cells. MS is probably the most variable condition in all of medicine. You have people with MS who you would never know it. They would never know it. They go through their whole lives and never have problems. You have people with MS that have horrific problems that happen really, really quickly and everything in between. And there's a bunch of different reasons for that, but luck is one of the reasons that that happens, or bad luck in this case. If people are having fires that are hitting these critical areas and symptoms are just starting to pile up versus other people that are having fires that your brain is moving jobs around, it can mean that someone with the same disease looks drastically different. But luck isn't the biggest factor. There, a bigger factor is how frequently these fires are happening. So if you were to take two buildings and say they're both prone to fires, what's going to happen to them in 10 years? You kind of need more information because one of them might be prone to fires in that a fire shows up, you know, someone leaves a coffee pot on and affects one of the walls before it goes out. And that happens every few years or so. That's multiple sclerosis because it's you're at risk for it happening over and over again. Another building might have fires that show up every 
couple of months. And when they happen, they rip through a whole corridor. Also multiple sclerosis, same disease, huge difference for those two people. Even if neither of them have any symptoms at the moment that you can see, because 90% of those fires don't cause symptoms. So many people can have this going on for a long time and not know it. But just like, uh, just like in a, in a, a, an office like this, the more fires you have, the more chances you are to hit these places and more chances you have to pile up issues over time. Then there's sort of another layer on top of that, which is imagine that building having fires year after year, plus everything else that affects your brain negatively throughout life. Please, God, stop smoking cigarettes, anyone, um, or whatever else. At some point, you can get damage to the structure of the building. And at that point, the building can start to collapse in on itself. That's a different thing because hitting that one with a fire hose isn't going to do anything. It's not the same process anymore. So it's still MS, but now this is what we talk about when we say progressive MS. I get the question all the time when I'm talking to someone, what kind of MS do I have? And it seems like it's a simple question to answer, but it's not. And it's not really accurate to say that there are all these different types of MS. It's that MS, just like we are, are changing over time. For everybody with MS, there will be fires. Not everybody will have symptoms from those fires. And some people with fires are at risk that at some point that building can start to collapse at some point in the future. And that building collapsing can look many, many different ways. So progressive MS can be something where there's a rapid decline very, very quickly over a short period of time, years or two or three years, something like that. It could be something that very, very slowly, something gets worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. But that is fundamentally a different thing. And it's something that's very, very difficult to treat. We're a lot better at treating the fires. So we've known about MS for 200 years. We've known that MS has something to do with the immune system for over 100 or almost 100 years. And yet we couldn't do anything about it until the 1990s. That was when the first treatment came out that actually allowed us to play a little defense against MS. And since then, we've had more and more treatments that are available that are now starting to play a little offense against MS. But all of the treatments have one job, their fire suppression. They're there to stop new fires. Thus, they're something that is most effective overall as early as we can possibly use them. Because the more fires you have over time, the higher that chance is over time. Um, so there's ways we know about MS, um, a lot of tests that we can do, but by far the most important test is the MRI. MRIs are lots of fun for several hours, loud clanking noise. And at some point someone yells at you to stop moving. And then eventually it's done and we have a picture. And what that picture is telling us is the same thing into this building and look at the walls would tell us. You want to fires have happened. If you look over there, you see a big area. So, you know, a fire happened. You don't necessarily know when, but you know, it happened at some point. You come in a year later, you look again, you see a new area of soot, you know another fire happened in that chunk of time. Um, and in that sense, you can get a sense over time of how many fires somebody is having, how frequently they're occurring. And that kind of helps us figure out what types of treatments we're going to move somebody towards. But um, there, there are many things beyond the treatments that we use for MS that are as important, and I would say actually much, much, much more important. That's why I'm, I'm glad to be at a, in an audience like this where we're talking about all the other things that go into taking care of yourself, taking care of people with multiple sclerosis or any, or any other condition, because our body doesn't exist in isolation. And if somebody is having a problem or some sort of symptom, they're at risk for that symptom to happen again in the future. And what I mean by that is that not every symptom that somebody has is going to be always present with them. Somebody, if you take an example of a, something like weakness in your arm, your arm gets weak and 
if you're having trouble moving it, but your brain is then figuring out ways to move that job to other areas and make your arm work again. So you get to a point where now your arm is functioning well, but fast forward five years or 10 years and you get the flu or you get COVID or you're under a ton of stress at work or you're not sleeping well. And now that symptom is at risk to come back, even if it isn't something that you usually deal with. The way I I think about symptoms is if you just imagine your brain or imagine a symptom like a boulder being thrown into a lake, it's something where immediately you might get pretty big disruption, but then that boulder sort of settles down somewhere and it might not be something where you normally see it, but the level of the lake is not always the same. It's going up, it's going down. And if something drops that level down, now those symptoms get substantially worse. And This is what happens with heat for many people with MS. There's a um, sort of a misconception about heat in MS that people are doing damage when they're out in hot weather, if they're in a hot tub or something like that. We used to tell patients, don't go into a hot tub because their symptoms will get worse. It's not that new damage is being caused. It's not causing a new fire, but it's dragging the level of the lake down. And that means your symptoms are going to get temporarily worse. There's many, many, many things that do that. And what we want people to do is one of the most important things that I'm telling a new patient with MS is that you need to do things that keep your level of the lake high. You need to be doing everything you can do to get that level up. And there isn't one thing that does that. Yoga is a great example with a ton of evidence in MS, a fantastic way of getting that level up as high as you can. There are many, many other ones. It's something where there isn't something that any one patient needs to do other than recognize that this is something that's very, very important because it's going to protect them from ever sort of seeing the problems that can can happen over time. Um, So uh, the other things that I want to tell MS patients when I first see them are that it's very, very important for us to keep an eye on things. I'm not gonna tell a patient you have to be on a medication or you have to be on this or there are people that decide that they're not gonna be on medications or that we don't have on medications for other reasons. That's perfectly fine, but we wanna know what's going on. And that means most importantly, coming to clinic visits, Um, but also getting the MRIs or the blood tests or the things that we need to do because Things can go fine for people. There might be chunks of time where there's no fires. There might be chunks of time where they're doing great. Um, But we want to know, we want to have a plan in place beforehand rather than having to catch up once these issues have started to accumulate because it's much, much easier to prevent than to cure something. Um, So uh, I'm happy to, I'm happy to take any questions but none that involves me doing any sort of pose. Mindy. We're going to, people are putting their questions in, in the Q&A on the webinar. And then if anyone had questions for Dr. Pace, we're taking them at the end. There's one more speaker and then we'll have a panel at the end. Okay. So don't anyone ask any questions right now, <laughs> but save some questions. I'd be happy to answer them later. I, I really appreciate the opportunity of being here and groups like this, because it's something where I can tell someone until I'm blue in the face, yoga is important. You know, diet is important, but it, it, it's a different thing when you're, you know, sitting with the white coat on. And I see a couple of my patients around that know that I've never worn that white coat or I haven't worn it in the last 15 years, but um, it's a different thing when it's coming from me uh, than it is when it's coming from people that are living it, walking it, and seeing many people that are going through it. So I really appreciate it, your organization, what you guys do. Thank you so much. I met someone in the, um, one of our guests in person, and she said she just got diagnosed and she didn't know where the turn and she was so happy that you were addressing this topic today and that she was together in community with all of us. Thank you.